In this video today, I'll be talking about the risk management practices that occur on ships. Now, most of the tasks that take place on ships require a risk assessment before the beginning of the task. This is the job of a senior officer on board who allots jobs to his juniors and before doing so must conduct an adequate risk assessment to identify the risk and then develop strategies to counter the risk. Whilst there is no single agreed model for maritime risk assessment, there are many sources of information on risk assessment on board ship. The approach that we discussed today in our slides is largely based on the two documents that you show on your screen. Remember, every company may have their own model of risk assessment and you necessarily, you necessarily don't have to agree with mine. Go as per the model that is recommended by your company, of course. The basic idea still remains the same, that you have to identify the risk, the magnification of the risk, and then develop strategies to address those risk. Basically, there are two general approaches to risk assessment. The first one is a qualitative risk assessment, which relies heavily on agreed values being assigned to each element of the assessment based on the combined experience of those carrying out the assessment. It can be applied to any hazard. The other approach is a quantitative risk assessment, which is based on available data relating to each particular hazard. It is therefore generally limited to those hazards with significant risk on which sufficient data exists. It is essentially computer generated and may lack valuable human insight. Today's focus will be on a qualitative risk assessment approach. Because this is for practical purposes, will provide a meaningful outcome in all cases. But since it is based on the experience of those making the assessment, it can readily be incorporated into their knowledge of available data. At this point of time, I must draw your attention to the fact that risk assessment is not such a small topic that can be discussed in a five to seven minutes video. The reason I have discussed this is basically to just give you an idea and the principles behind the practice of risk assessment on ships. Risk assessment is a vast topic and it includes various aspects that should be considered. An example being the culture of a person, where the person originates from. So it is often seen that depending on the country from where a person originates also impacts their risk assessment or risk management strategies on board ships. There have been many, many, many studies, numerous studies that have been done into risk assessment in maritime and non-maritime context. It was not possible for me to cover all literature. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that you should be reading more and more literature if you want to enhance your knowledge about risk assessment. This is just a basic video because seafarers on the ships just need knowledge for a practical application. Of course, there is no end to theory that can be learned about any topic. The basic concept of risk assessment is to identify any hazards that exist in the workplace or that affects a task to be performed on the ship. A hazard can be defined as a potential source of damage or harm. Part of the risk assessment also requires you to examine the hazard to decide the extent of any risk that is reasonably foreseeable. A risk comprises of mainly two elements, the likelihood of the harm and the severity of the harm if it does occur and consideration of the precautions already in place to mitigate the risk. Example, has permits to work, warning signs, restricted access and personal protective equipment. For example, if you're deciding to launch a live boat just for a drill purpose, what are the risks that can be occurring during such a practice? Think about the likelihood of the harm think about the severity of the harm if the risk does occur. In that case, what is the required by you as a seafarer? Do you need to put warning signs in any place? Do you need to obtain a permit to work? For example, if you are doing it in port, do you need to warn the other ships? Do you need to inform the port authority? What kind of restricted access? So can you maneuver the boat wherever you want to? Or do you only have restricted space? And what kind of personal protective equipment you would need to wear? Life jackets? hard hats, safety belts. So think about it in this way. 
by combining the two elements that we talked about in the previous slide, the risk may then be classified as intolerable, tolerable or absolutely negligible. Or it can be classified as very low, which is acceptable, low, which is tolerable, medium or high, those that should be reduced to an acceptable or tolerable level and very high risk, which are completely unacceptable. Action can then be taken on the basis of predetermined guidelines. One of the frameworks that we can use in risk assessment looks like this. What do we mean by likelihood of harm that occurs from risk? What does, mean, what does it mean to be very likely to occur? Likely to occur, unlikely and very unlikely. For example, if you are working inside the accommodation, it is very unlikely that you would fall into the sea. However, if you are working aloft or you are working overside, painting the ship's site, it may be in port, but the likelihood of you falling into the sea then becomes very likely. So that is how you have to identify the risk associated with a particular job. So very likely could mean typically experienced at least once every six months by an individual. Likely could mean typically experienced once every five years by an individual. Unlikely could be typically experienced once during the working lifetime of an individual and very like unlikely is less than 1% chance of being experienced by an individual during the working lifetime. However, this is just an example. Do not take the values here very seriously. Different frameworks suggest different values and different way of defining the likelihood of harm. This is just one of the ways I am highlighting. Of course, if you read more books and you go through more frameworks, you will find this information varying. At the end of the day, all you have to do is basically identify the risk and identify how likely are those risks to occur and if they occur what is the severity of the harm that it may suffer a person may suffer due to the risk occurring now when we talk about severity of harm this is how we can define it we can define it under the categories of health and safety and further establish the categories of slightly harmful moderately harmful or extremely harmful you can see the examples that we have put up in slightly harmful when it comes to health, which is nuisance and irritation. For example, headaches. They are slightly harmful. Moderately harmful could be temporary deafness, asthma, dermatitis or skin related diseases. And extremely harmful could be occupational cancer, severe life shortening diseases or even permanent disability or death. So you can see the differences between slightly harmful, moderately harmful and extremely harmful. For example, if you are, if you see a dangerous good being leaked from a container and you ask a person to go and clean that dangerous good, you don't know what kind of chemicals may be released from the dangerous good. In that case, that doesn't become a routine operation. You must read about the dangerous good and take adequate precautions. Otherwise, what you may see as a slightly harmful risk occurring could be extremely harmful for that person who has gone and exposed himself or herself to the dangerous goods or the fumes or the gases that may be emitting from the dangerous goods. One of the frameworks that is used also looks like this. Here you identify not only the risks according to whether they are likely to occur, unlikely to occur, but also classify them under whether the risks are, once the risk occurs, as the severity harm is slightly harmful, moderately harmful or extremely harmful. Now, of course, like I said, different companies sometimes use different frameworks. Your company may have another framework. I actually have access to a number of frameworks that I could have put up. But basically, all the frameworks lead to the identification of the risk and the severity of the harm. So there was no point of me discussing the different frameworks. The idea here is to inform you that if a framework exists in your company, you must educate and train yourselves in using that framework because tomorrow when you become a senior officer and you are allotting jobs to your juniors, you must conduct a risk assessment as per the framework provided in your company. That justifies you in drawing up permits to work, allowing your crew to work and if tomorrow something happens then you can justify it legally that you did take all the precautions before starting the task. Here you can see that the framework has been further defined where very low has been defined as the risks which are considered acceptable and no further action is necessary other than to ensure that the controls are maintained whereas on the extreme side very high risk have been considered those which are unacceptable 
substantial improvements in risk control are then necessary so that the risk is reduced to a tolerable or acceptable level. Remember, risks are always managed. You cannot absolutely remove a risk. You cannot claim that there is no risk to a task even when you have taken the precautions. So always use the word risk have been managed and that is why when there are uh, high risks involved, you can only claim it to reduce it to a tolerable and acceptable level. You cannot say you have removed the risk from occurring. So precautions are necessary irrespective of whether you acquire a permit to work or whether you fill in an ISM checklist or you claim to have removed all the risk. You must still monitor the risk. As a senior officer, you must make sure that that job is being supervised, especially jobs which are considered high risk jobs on your ships, such as working aloft, working oversight, working in enclosed spaces, working in confined spaces, so on and so forth. This video only tried to show you the responsibility that senior officers wear on their shoulders before tasks can be allocated to the juniors. In that case, it is essential that you can out a risk assessment and you document that risk assessment so that tomorrow, if God forbid something goes wrong, you can justify that document as a means to protect yourself legally. An example here I'll tell you is a few years back or a couple of years back, a cadet who had just joined the ship and was it was his second or third day was asked to go and inspect a tank with the bosun. The cadet while climbing down the ladder fell to his death. It was a very unfortunate incident because of which the chief officer was reprimanded very harshly. Now here the chief officer should have conducted a risk assessment to determine if the cadet has acquired sufficient experience to go down a tank for inspection. Now although sometimes accidents cannot be avoided, it is your job as a senior officer to make sure you conduct an adequate risk assessment before you allow your crew members to go and perform any task. At this point here, I will stop here the video and before stopping and before leaving you, I must summarize that when the risk assessment has been completed and control measures have been formulated, make sure a safe work procedure is written. The safe work procedure should be made available to all concerned before the work to which it refers is commenced. Action should be taken to ensure the procedures are fully understood by those who have to follow them. Risk assessment and control is a continuous process which must be kept under review to ensure their validity and effectiveness. So at the end of the day, as a senior officer, you must monitor the task and continuously identify risk. There could be some new risk that develop due to new conditions. In that case, you must draw a new work permit or new safe work procedure or stop the work immediately and always give priority to safety of life safety of ship and safety of the cargo before any other task. I'll stop the video here guys and let me know what you think about this video through your feedback and comments. I'll see you soon with my next video. Bye.